greetings in the awesome, wonderful, and magnificent name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome into the Tuesday night edition and rendition of MTV's Facebook Live Bible Study, emanating on behalf of the Mount Vernon Missionary Baptist Church. <laughs> oh my God, Auburn, Alabama where Jesus, the Christ, Yeshua, is Lord, and I have been privileged and honored to serve as pastor and CEO for the past 35 years now. And I count it a joy, Reverend Snoop, to present the good news, the gospel, the Gillian to each of you. Thank you for inviting me into your Facebook space. Miss Enette Reese, good evening to you as well. All of our friends down 29, good evening to each of you. I trust that God, Bird, Miss Mary Thomas, I trust that God is moving miraculously in your life and you're walking in the favor of God. Deacon John Reese, good evening to you. All right, Bunny, time for you to come on back to church now. Uh, you, you've been, you had long enough to recuperate. God bless you. Uh, and, uh, Dorothy, good evening to you. As I said, I trust that God is moving miraculously in your life and you're walking in the favor and the blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ and he's showering his blessings upon you because God is in the blessing business. Matter of fact, he told me to remind somebody that there is no good thing that he will withhold from you. So that suggests to me that if you don't have it, if God hadn't given it to you, then right now it's just not good for you. Call a neighbor, call a friend. Uh, if you know their number, call an enemy and invite them to join us tonight. I'm going to try to be not too long tonight so I can go to the game and watch Auburn basketball team beat Loach Polka basketball team. But we'll just let the Holy Spirit have his way. For those of you who are inclined, please share the broadcast. And we'll go from there. Um, we are matriculating and making our way through the gospel of St. Luke. And we have made it to St. Luke chapter number 12. And tonight, the Lord willing, we will make our way through uh, verses 35 through verses through verse number 48. Miss Gracie Talbert, good evening to you. Verses 35 through 48, and hopefully we'll get that far. If we don't, we'll get as far as we can and pick up there next week because, as you all know by now, I am an ex, um, expository preacher, a teacher. I just go word for word. Uh, line by line, precept by precept. Let's let the text do the talking. Verses 35 in Luke chapter 12 is on readiness. If I had to tab a title to the text, I would tell you to be ready when he comes. Evangelist Frazier, good evening to you. I would tell you to be ready because when he comes, because this uh, passages these verses are strictly about readiness. Now, in order to teach this text properly, if you're going to teach this text, most preachers won't preach it because uh, unless they're expository preachers. Um, but if you're going to teach this or preach this or study this, you have to think like a Jew and think in terms of Jewish culture. But more importantly, Everything about the, these verses in its context, they have to do with the imminent return of the Lord. If you take any of these verses out of the setting of eschatology is the word, uh, uh, the imminent return and judgment of humanity by Jesus Christ. If you take any part of this of these verses out of the end time, the found day of judgment context, 
then you are doing injustice to the text. Okay? This is all about being ready when he comes. And there are three things I want to talk about tonight as it relates to being ready when he comes in this text. Number one, I want to talk about the doctrine of readiness. Number two, I want to talk about the discipline of readiness. Miss Monetta Wilson, good evening to you. And thirdly, we'll talk about the danger of not being ready. Three quick, easy points. They so easy tonight. Uh, Miss Talbot, you could teach this. Let's let the text do the talking. The doctrine of being ready, the discipline of being ready, and the danger of not being ready. Brethren and sisters, this preach. Let's look first of all at the doctrine of readiness. It's summed up in verse number 40. It says, be ye or you be or y'all be therefore ready. Three things verse 40 teaches us about the doctrine of being ready. First of all, Miss Yvonne H. Whitfield, it gives us a command. Look at what it says in the A verse. We let the tech do the talking. He's saying, be ye therefore ready. So the command is for us, for you and I, to be ready. What's context? When Jesus returns. The command is for those of us who have established already our readiness. Because if you are not born again, if you are not saved, if you have not received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and made him Lord of your life, invited him in, Miss Melinda, good evening to you, and made him ruler numero numero in your life, you are not ready. But if, in fact, you have made him number one in your life by believing in him and his finished work on the cross, that qualifies you to be ready when he comes. He gives you a command. He gives us a command. Look at the text. Verse 8. Be ye therefore ready. The command. But not only does the doctrine of a readiness talks about in verse 40, the command to be ready. The command to be ready. Secondly, it talks about the, it gives us a certainty. Number one, the command. Number two, the certainty, the B clause. For the Son of Man cometh. Oh my God. Son of Man was Jesus' favorite title for himself from Ezekiel chapter number seven. It was his messianic title for himself. Taz, good evening to you, my brother. So the doctrine, first of all, has to do with the congregation being born again. Secondly, it had to do with the command to us to be ready. And then it gives us a certainty. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ will soon, I'm sorry, he will return. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number four. And let's lay anchor there. 1 Thessalonians, that's Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica. We're talking about the readiness of God. And we're first of all talking about the doctrine of readiness. The congregation needs to be ready. Those of us who are born again, we are ready. But he commands us to be ready. And then he gives us a certainty in the text. He says he is, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ, is coming back. First Thessalonians, I believe everybody got it but me. There it is right there. First Thessalonians chapter, glory to God, chapter number four uh, and verse number 13. He says, but I would not have you to be ignorant. One of the things God and Paul and the Bible does not, and your pastor and your preacher and your teacher don't want you to be is ignorant. So Paul says, I brought, but I would not have you to be ignorant. Now, let, let me put this in context. Um, Paul was writing to these knucklehead Christians because somebody had convinced them that they had missed the resurrection. So Paul is saying, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are dead or, or asleep, 
that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Don't be like those that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also will sleep in Jesus will bring with him. Jesus is going to bring with him. He's coming back. Verse 15. For this we say unto you that by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, he coming back, shall not prevent them which will sleep. Those of us who are alive are not going to prevent those who've already passed away and gone uh, um, um, and fallen asleep or died. Verse 16, for the Lord, the, the Lord Adonai, capital Y, capital H, capital W, capital H, Adonai, the Tetragrammaton, for the Lord, because it's all, uh, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, he's coming back, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, this shall material, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. I don't want you to be ignorant. Then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we forever be with the Lord. The, the certainty is he's coming back. The command is to be ready. The certainty is, Bunny, he's coming back. <laughs> Glory to God. The command is be ready when he comes. Remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 1 through 9, when Jesus got ready to go, after he, had after he was resurrected from the dead, he told the folk, he said, y'all go back to Jerusalem. He says, uh, uh, and then and then he was taken up in a cloud. Ms. Anna Reese, good evening to you. And then, the, and then those idiots stood there gazing. And then the angel said, why y'all standing here gazing? The Lord gave y'all instruction and he told you just like he's leaving, he's coming back. Please understand me. Jesus is coming back and we need to be ready. Those are the, uh, uh, those are the two points on the doctrine and they're all in, in verse number 40. Be ye therefore ready also for the son of man cometh. So not only does he give us a command and a certain preacher, this will preach all by itself. You can talk about the command, the certainty, and thirdly, he gives us the uncertainty. What an oxymoron. He says, I'm giving you a certainty. He is coming. But I'm giving you an uncertainty. You don't know when he's coming. Look at the text. For he's coming at an hour when you think not. We don't know. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Glo glory to God because I need to establish this. He gives us the command. Thank you, my Lord. He gives us certainty. But the uncertainty is we don't know when he's coming. That's why we ought to be forever ready. The command is to, uh, is to be ready. The certainty is he's coming. And the uncertainty is we don't know when he's coming. Glory to God. But we have an assurance that he is coming. What did I tell you all turn to 1 Thessalonians Chapter number five, look at verse one. But notice what he says here. But of the times and the season, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. I don't need to write unto you when he returned. Okay, verse, verse two. For you yourself perfectly know that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And you don't know when a thief coming. And he's saying, it's uncertain. You don't know when I'm coming. Just know, preaching my another, just know that he's coming. <laughs> Glory to God. And be ready when he comes. What did the songwriter say? Be ready when, don't let him catch you with your work undone. And I think Diane sang a song that, uh, uh, that said, will you be ready when the Lord returns? So the doctrine is the congregation, meaning those who are born again, we, have, we, we are qualified to be ready, but we need to make sure we are ready. All right. Uh, he gives us he gives us a command in verse forty to be ready. He gives us a certainty. Why? Because the Lord is coming back, and then he gives us an uncertainty. We don't know when he is coming, but according to Ephesians chapter five, Teresa Thomas, good evening to you. According to uh, Ephesians chapter five, verse twenty-seven, he's coming back at an ecclesia. That's the word for church. He's coming back out of church. That's without spot nor wrinkle. He's coming back at the church, not the building, but he's coming at, back, at, back at the people that's been born again, that's been saved, that's been redeemed, that's been washed in the blood. Those of us who are ready for him to return. 
Glory to God. So that's the doctrine of readiness. Verse 40, the command, the certainty, and the uncertainty. I told y'all it was real easy teaching tonight. Can I ask you a question? Are you ready? Can I ask you a question? Are you ready? They asked an old man, Ann and Manetta, uh, that was, that was uh, tilling his garden. They said, old man, if you knew the Lord was returning in the next five minutes, what would you do? The old man said, I would just keep on working in my God because I, because I got my mind made up and my business fixed. If what you are doing now, you got to stop and do it. If the Lord returned and maybe you ought not be doing it <laughs> because somebody said we ought to live like he died yesterday and coming back today. Glory to God. The doctrine, get the doctrine now, because I don't want to leave it if y'all don't have it. Verse 40, the doctrine of readiness. He gives us a command, be ready. He gives us a certainty, he is coming. But then he gives us an uncertainty, we don't know when. We got to move from the discipline, I'm sorry, the doctrine in verse 40, to move to the discipline of readiness. Because there's some things that you've got to do to make sure that you're ready when he comes. All right, number one, discipline is you've got to be weighty. Pastor, let the text do the talking. Look at verse 36. And you yourselves, like unto men that wait, that wait. So the first doctor, for the first discipline you got to have is you got to learn to wait on the Lord's return. Now, Jesus, the church has been waiting for over 2,000 years. But that does not mean we, get, we can get slack in our waiting. The opposite of waiting is leaving. Let me say that again. The opposite of waiting is getting tired, getting weary, and then stop looking for him to come. Verse 36, and ye yourself like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from a wedding, that when he cometh, he knocketh, that he may open, that they may open unto him immediately. Jesus is using a story here about a, um, um, about a man who leaves home to, uh, 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 to go to a wedding and he leaves the servants at home and he tells the servants to wait until he gets back. I know that right. Preaching Melissa, leaving is not an option. Leaving is not an option. Now you may get tired, but don't get out. But if you get tired, remember he said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of an eagle, rock, walk and not be weary, one, uh, um, run and not be weary, walk and not faint. He says, he, he says you got to wait like the servers wait on the master when he goes to wedding. Keep it in Jewish culture. Wedding lasted weeks at a time. So, so the servants of the house never knew exactly when the master of the house was going to come, was going to come back. So they had to wait. How are we waiting? We are waiting not um, pa passively, but we're waiting actively. We are waiting and we are, are, are anticipating that he would, that he might just return. They that wait upon the Lord, you're right, the Lord shall renew their strength. How are we supposed to wait? Go back up to verse number 35 and let, let the dead do the talking. He said, Lie, he said, let your loins be girded. In other words, what that had to do with, that had to do with the garment that the people wear. He, he said, make sure you're waiting with your right clothes on and make sure you have your right, make sure you are right. Keep it in mind. Keep in mind now, he's talking about when he returns. What is he looking for? He's looking for your loins to be girded up. What does that mean? The men in that culture, in the Jewish culture, they wore uh, what we would call skirts, but they were uh, uh, tunics. And, and they had all kind of little things at the bottom of the tunic. But oftentimes they would go down to their ankle and they couldn't move quickly. They couldn't run quickly. They couldn't move quickly. They couldn't work quickly. So where you see here, let your loins be girded. He's saying, pull that skirt up, tie it up, so that you are ready to go at a moment's notice. Now, as I said last week, we're not putting in an application to go. Glory to God. But we are ready to go. I believe it was the shot like you long time ago said, and, and it had nothing to do with going to heaven, but they said, I'm ready even if I don't get to go. 
So we got to be forever ready. We've got to be prepared. That's what the loins girded me. Tie that skirt up so you can move in a moment. So I think it goes back to Exodus chapter number 12 when uh, Jesus, when, when the God was getting ready to give the Passover, he gave the instruction. He told them to put shoes on, get the unleavened out. I mean, get the leaven out, uh, gird up their loins because what was going to happen, it was going to happen quickly. And the Bible says, in the moment of a twinkling of an eye, the Lord shall return. So we need to be prepared. We need to be forever ready. Now, if you shucking and jiving, you ain't ready. If you getting tired of uh, 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 of of God and 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 getting tired of your assignment, talking about God ain't a religion ain't working, Christianity ain't working, then you are getting tired. Glory to God. Get tired, but don't quit. Okay, Teresa said the Roman soldier tied their tunic up between their legs before before they went to battle. Cool, because. Uh, uh, if they didn't tie him up, they would be hindered. He's, he's, he's simply talking about being ready. Not only does he say in verse 35, uh, be, uh, be ready with your clothes and, and be ready. He said, but, but um, have your lights burning. That has to do with not only readiness, but relationship. He says, make sure... You remember the story of the ten virgins, five were wise, five were foolish, five took oil and took some extra oil and others took no extra oil. And while they went to sleep, they turned the lamp down. And then when the bridegroom came, they started what they call trimming the lamp, turning them up. And the five foolish had no extra oil. And, and, and then preachers are louder. You talking about the oil represent the Holy Ghost. You can't go and buy and sell no Holy Ghost. Melissa, no need to pray that you be ready. That's what the song says. I pray that I be ready. You know you're ready because you've been born again. Check this out. You are you you know the command to be ready. You know the certainty is, he is coming and you don't know when. And you're watching. Oh, I'm sorry, you're waiting. You are waiting on his return. And we and you've already concluded quitting and turning around. Is not an option. The Bible says no man put his hand on the gospel plow and look back and been fit for the kingdom. Kingdom grace, uh, a covenant grace said God does not want anything to hinder us. That's why he have, uh, why we have to lay aside every weight. Cool. Lay aside every weight and these sins that so easily set us back. We are waiting. Notice what the text said, waiting on the Lord like these servants were, were waiting on the master. Number one, under discipline, we are waiting patiently on him, not passively, but patiently. Okay, uh, what's, uh, uh, what's, uh, what's actively waiting is what you do when you go to Red Lobster and you order a uh, 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 salmon from uh, New Orleans with baked potatoes and um, uh, salad on, on the side, you are anticipating something. You're waiting. I mean, hopefully you're not cutting the food. You're not cussing people out, being impatient. You are waiting patiently, but you are anticipating. You are anticipating them bringing you your food at any moment. Glory to God. Or maybe you ought to wait like the old, the old ladies used to wait on what we would call the eagle fly. <laughs> oh my God. In, 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 our, in our neighborhood, uh, Manel and Teresa, you would see all the old ladies at the front door or in the window because they had this little code, uh, uh, this little system where if the mailman came to you first, you will call everybody and say he on the way. Why? Because they were patiently and waiting and anticipating on their government check. And mailman got to you first, or if he hadn't got to them, they called him and said, look, has he been by your house? No, he ain't been by my house yet. Because I know once he come by your house, glory to God, my house right around the corner. Monique, it was you one day that said, that, uh, that they said he in the neighborhood. And I'm anticipating I'm patiently waiting. Now, please understand, in the context, he's talking about waiting on him to return. But there are some things we just got to wait for down, down here also. But in context, I'm telling y'all, if you're going to understand this, you've got to keep it in the context 
of when Jesus is coming back. Reverend Stokes, good evening to you. All right. All right. So number one, he, he, he says on the discipline, he says, you got to wait. I, I'm waiting. That's verse 36. In verse 37, he says, not only are we waiting patiently, we're not getting, we're not giving out. We're not turning around. We're not giving up. But secondly, he says, discipline involves watching. Pastor, if you're going to exegete the text, you show better tell me, you better show me watching in the text. And that's what I'm trying to teach y'all. If a preacher tell you he bringing a point, then he need to get the point out of the text or he ain't preaching it right. And glory to God. Now, I really he can get a point and, and, and then kind of get out and then go somewhere else and prove the point. But if you're going to exegete a text, the point need to first of all be in the text. Glory to God. All right. Let's see where he's watching. Verse 37, bless, almost like a beatitude. He says, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, find watching. Watching. Verily, I say unto you that he shall gird himself. This, this is how my Jesus here now. And make them sit down to meet a banquet. And will come forth and serve them. Now we're really not sure when he's going to do this serving, but this is the great. This, I mean, I mean, you, you talking about Jesus serving us? You remember when he washed the disciples' feet, and then Peter going to protest, talking about, "Lord, you never wash my feet." And Jesus said, "Peter, you idiot! If I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part with me." Peter said, "Well, Lord, if you don't put it that way, give me a whole bath." He says, but you're also watching. What's the opposite of watching? Distracted. Here's my challenge. Don't get distracted while you are waiting on him. Because life is full of distractions. People whispering in your ear can be a distraction. Facebook sure can be a distraction. Your family, your friends can all be distraction. And what he's saying, Robert, good evening to you, do not allow him to come back while you are distracted. Distracted from what? Some of y'all are already distracted. Glory to God. You're distracted from prayer. You don't pray. But yet, you believe prayer changes things. You're distracted from giving. I mean, you used to give out of your need. Now you won't even give out of your abundance. Distracted. You're distracted in your church attender. You're distracted. The devil is just distracting you everywhere. And if the Lord returns, he would come back finding you distracted, not watching for him. The discipline, number one, verse 36, waiting on it. Number two, we're watching, watching for his return. And if you're watching for his return, you can't be distracted because check this out. You can't focus on two things at the same time. Now, I not mean, I mean, obviously, you, you got to live your life. You got to do what you got to do. But, but, but your ultimate focus is on, I need to be ready because he may come back today. Your ultimate watching is, I'm watching for his, now I'm not watching return, but I'm watching for the signs. Matthew 24 gives us a lot of signs. And I, I'm not going to the signs. I just want to teach you the discipline. The doctrine is, he gave us a command in verse 40. He gave us a, a certainty in verse 40. And he gave us an uncertainty. And then, he's, and then he went to the discipline. He said, first of all, you got to be waiting on him. Verse 36. 37, you got to be watching. Watch and pray. Opposite of watching is either blind or distracted. Verse number 39. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, for verse 39. And this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he's given a, a, another story, he, he would have watched. He said, you need to be watching 
Dr. Griffin. You need to be watching for him just like a homeowner would watch for a thief. Or a thief ain't going to come when you when he know you sitting there with your nine millimeter. When he knows you are prepared. So what Jesus is saying is, I am going to purposely come when you are not expecting me to come. Why? Because I need you to be forever ready. Don't stop wait, waiting. Don't stop watching. He said, and had not suffered his house to be broken through. Verse 40. Be ye therefore, that's, uh, 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 that's the doctrine. Be ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh in an hour when, he, when you think not. Okay? He's going to purposely come at the most inopportune time. Glory to God. Verse 41. Then Peter, Petros, said unto him, Lord, speaketh thou this parable unto us or even unto all? Because see, Jesus and had vacillated between talking to the disciples and talking to the crowd. Talking to the crowd. Talking to the crowd. So when Jesus gave this parable, uh, the, uh, this parable up here uh, uh, about the man who went away and uh, left his service in charge and they were supposed to be ready when he came and they were ready when he came and they got and 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 they were rewarded. Peter said, Lord, are you is it meant for us, the disciples? Is it meant for the crowd or is it meant for everybody? Now, parable is an earthly story cast beside um, a heavenly meaning. Yeah, Peter was Peter. But but Miss Manetta, most of us are more are more like Peter than anybody else in, in the Bible. All right. Um, verse 42. And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward? Steward is one who has been entrusted with another's property and have the full authority of the one that uh, that entrusted him. I don't own my house. I'm, uh, the, uh, the mortgage company own it, but I'm a steward. I don't I don't quite own my car. Uh, the bank owns it, but I'm a steward. I have full authority over it. That's what a steward is. Okay? Um, that that faithful and wise steward, he said, man, they were faithful and they were wise. That's who, that's who that was for. Whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household. Because if you're ready when he comes, being born again, you've been waiting, you've been watching, there, there, there's one more. He is going to make you ruler over many things. Glory to God. To give him a portion of the meat in due season. That's when he returned. Keep it in, in his context. Okay? Now, we talked about the discipline. Waiting, verse 36. We told you the text to do the talking if you just let it. We talked about, you got the discipline of uh, watching, verse 37. Finally, he said, not only have, is, are you disciplined in your watching, in your waiting, but you're disciplined in your working Check this out. Verse number, Pastor, you better show me working in the text if you're going to be an exegetical preacher. Let's see if we see work. Verse number 43. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, find him so doing, working, doing his assignment. What's the opposite of doing? Quitting, not doing. Reneging on your Assignment. Are you do? Are you doing the work that the Lord? Us now we're not saved by work, but we are saved. Preach, boy, to work. James said it this way: Faith without work is dead. <laughs> Faith without corresponding behavior is dead. Paul said it this way: If you don't work, you don't eat. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse number ten. Everybody, I mean, I mean, all Christians have all Christians have jobs to do. What has God assigned you to do, and are you doing it while you're waiting and while you're watching? Are you working? Jesus said, uh, uh, "Send some folk in the vineyard." He, he said, "Go and work. Whatever's right." He told the last one, "Whatever's right, I'll pay." See, payday is coming after a while. Glory to God. Payday is coming after a while. I need to encourage you all to keep working, keep watching, and keep waiting.
Don't get, don't get weary in well-doing. In due season, oh my God. In due season, you'll reap if you don't quit. And I know some of y'all feel like quitting. Don't quit. Quitting, as Monique said, quitting is not an option. We're going to hang in there. We're going to fight a good fight. Change, you're right, my nutter, it's got to come. Oh, he has to apologize for lying to us. <laughs> and he's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Working. Working. Songwriter said, may the work I've done speak for me. Are you working in his vineyard? Are you sitting on the side and letting everybody else do the work? Are you being true to your assignment? Because all of us have our own assignment as it relates to ministry. And when he comes back, is he going to catch you working? Or is he going to catch you resting? It's all right to rest. Or is he going to catch you quitting? Yeah, put it like that. All right. So, I told you it was really easy teaching tonight. Uh, the doctrine, the discipline. Now let's get to the danger. Okay? Keep in mind, keep it in its context. It's talking about when he when he when he returns, the eschatology. Okay, verse number forty-four. Of uh, the truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he had. That that goes with working. Okay, verse forty-five. But that's your word, bunny. But the subordinate conjunction. He's been talking about saved people. How he wants them to be ready. How he wants them to understand the command to be ready, the certainty to be ready, and the uncertainty to be ready for all time because we don't know when he comes. How he wants us to be disciplined, waiting, watching, and working. Okay? Now, now he's going to deal with the other crowd. Got to understand it that way. He's, he's going to deal with the other crowd. Those who are not, quote, faithful stewards. Those who are not have their lions girded, verse 35. Those who don't have their lights burning. Because the light burning meant that they were awake and not sleep. <laughs> oh my God. I forgot to talk about sleep in there, but that's okay. Let's, let's deal with the other crowd now. Verse number 45. But, and if that servant say in his heart, what servant? The one that's been put over there. The one that has an assignment. This particular servant is over the house. He's over some more people, okay? Now, I know it says servant there, but please understand, every servant ain't saved. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, and Teresa was right here about following him as not a disciple. Every servant is not saved. Everybody following him is not a true disciple, okay? Because... Check out what the servant does here. Okay. He said, But if the servant say in his heart, My Lord, the owner of the house, delay his journey, de delay his coming. So this person is saying in his heart, I ain't got to watch, I ain't got to wait, I ain't got to work. <laughs> because I know in my heart the Lord ain't coming back anytime soon. Notice the danger. We talked about the doctrine. We talked about the discipline. Now, here's the danger. For you to think you know when the Lord is coming back and you can be like the bond building fool, eat, drink, and be merry. And you can just stop watching, stop waiting, stop working, and say, look, I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry because this watching and this waiting and this working, it ain't working and he ain't coming back now in no way. If the servant who ain't saved say in his heart, because if you say you ain't going to say in your heart, the Lord ain't coming back anytime soon. My Lord delay his coming. Now, I know what he's going to do. <laughs> Check out this idiot. Eh? And shall begin to beat the men servant. Now, in the reading of the Bible, it probably said men slave. Okay. You're right, Teresa. That's prideful and arrogant thinking. But it's getting away from watching, waiting, and working. 
Keep those three things in your mind. I got to watch, I got to wait, I got to work. Every day I got to watch, I got to wait, I got to work. He says he beat the men servants or slaves and the women. Who ready for the Lord to come running around here beating up folk? And did he tell us why? He said, get you going around beating up folk. He said, he said, because the Lord ain't, ain't, ain't returning, I think I just beat up these servants. <laughs> Idiot. He beat the Marmella. He beat up the women slave and the men slave. Then he began to eat and drink. Then the idiot got drunk. He wouldn't have got drunk after beating me up. Devil is a lie. I know he's just telling the story, but ain't nobody going to beat me up and get drunk. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. Okay. All right. Let, let me get back to the text. But notice what this man ain't saved. This man, this, this man is not saved. He's he not a leader. And then preachers erroneously take this out of context. Oh, this is the leaders of the church. These ain't no leaders of the church. These people are unsaved. He beating up folk. Men and women eating and he getting drunk. Talking about the Lord ain't returning soon. Okay. Yeah, they did that. They scorched him. I have no, I have no problem with that. Okay. Um, verse 46. The Lord of thy servant will come in that day and he look not for him and at that hour when he's not aware while he out there beating up folk Men and women drinking and drunk. And will cut him asunder. Gonna judge him. Cause you're gonna bring judgment on him. And will appoint him with a portion. The man is unsaved. Please understand me. The man, here, here, there. And put him with the unbelievers. He's going to hell. Put him with the unbelievers. Keep it in his context. Now. Verse 47 and 48. I ain't got a clue what they meant. <laughs> I know y'all don't like it when I tell y'all I don't know what it means. I have no earthly idea. So why you teach it? Because I, I just don't know what it means. I could give you some... Because see, because I'm a researcher and not a theologian, I don't research stuff looking for an answer. I research looking for the answer. And then when I research and see everybody all over the map by what they think some said, I just conclude they don't know what it means. But, but I'm going to read it to you. Because what I do know is preachers have taken this out of context. And I'm not taking it out of context. I'm going to leave it in its context. Now I know what it means if I take it out, out, out of context. Uh, you understand? Because okay, let's read it. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, talking about the man, because the Lord had told him, he's talking about this unbeliever here. And prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Now, at some point when the Lord returns, these people are going to be beaten with many stripes. Okay? At, at some point when the Lord returns, people like this man is going to be beaten. Those who knew the way didn't take the way, are going to be beaten with many stripes. Okay. Verse 48. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of strife, meaning that they ain't saved either, shall be beaten with a few stripes. Okay. So, so, so there are some that knew the way. Now, would beaten with stripes mean that most, most, okay. What beaten with stripes have mean? I don't know. I mean, it, it probably just means they're going to be punished. But there's a theory among, there's a theological position among the theologians, the Dallas theological seminarians and the, and the uh, PhDs of theology and uh, those who supposed to know, they teach a doctrine I don't understand. I'm not saying it's a doctrine. And what and how they explain this is, it says, for unto whomsoever much is given to him shall much be required. I mean, what we know that is, we know that means the greater the responsibility, um, um, 
the greater the gift, the greater the responsibility. Okay. Now they want to make that make mean religious people. Um, but he's still, but in his context, he's talking about when he returns. Okay. It says for him is much required to whom men have much have been, men have been committed much to him. They will ask more of him. The more you have, the more is, is expected of you. Now, the way the people that I really trust and follow their teaching, I'm talking about some real, really, really, really smart people. I mean, Princeton and Harvard and, and Dallas Theological Seminary instructors. Okay. Uh, they teach a, a doctrine, and I, and, I, and I don't know what it's called, but but... The position is this, um, that in heaven, everybody going to heaven won't get the same reward. They teach that there are different rewards in heaven. And there's scripture that they use to back that up. I just don't understand that because if I'm not going to know the difference, if, 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 if your crown uh, bet, fit bet mine, what, what difference does it make? I'm in heaven. But they teach that there are different um, um, that there are different rewards when you get to heaven and there are different levels of punishment when you get to hell and they teach that's what this is saying that that some will be uh, will be punished this much in hell and others will be punished that much that doctrine I don't understand uh, one day I will research it but uh, so I really don't know to just really be honest, I don't know what 45, 47, 48 mean. I do know this, though, that when the Lord returns, we all going to have to give an account of what we did in this body. And what he's telling us in this text, most importantly, most importantly, what he's telling us is to be ready when he comes. Three things we talked about. Verse 40, Diane, Miss Diane Preston, good evening to you. We talked about the um, doctrine of of readiness. We told you that he says, he gave us a command, be ready. He, that will call the bit. Um, yeah, yeah, my netta, but I'm not discounting it. I'm not my netta, uh, Dr. Stoke, because these, um, uh, my netta, these are people that know. I mean, these are people that know the Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, Latin, back and forth, up and down. They know the codexes. They know, they know it all. Uh, but I agree with you that uh, that seemed like that would cause problems in heaven, but I don't understand it all. So I just thought I would share that with y'all. OK, um, we talked about the command. Be ready in the doctrine. The uh, certainty he is coming back. The uncertainty. We don't know when we talked about the discipline. Be be waiting, be watching, be working. We talked about the danger. Don't let him catch you with your work undone. And God and and your greatest work was not work, but the greatest thing you can do is to give your life to Him. Okay, be ready when He comes. Here's my challenge: keep waiting, keep watching, keep working. Tanya said we'll understand it better. And see, I'm just bold enough to tell y'all, I'm not dogmatic. You know, there there are preachers who would hate to tell you, I don't know what that means. I just when I don't know, I just don't know. <laughs> Somebody may say, well, Pastor, you need to know. Well, I don't. God, God bless y'all. Peace. Assalamu alaikum. I don't know who's teaching tomorrow night. Uh, we are getting ready for my 35th pastoral anniversary. Oh, my God. We're having a banquet that Saturday night. Uh, Pastor D from Harvest Impact is going to come and speak to us on the banquet. And then the... Um, and then the next day we're having the anniversary. Uh, the pastor of St. Luke, uh, Opelika, Alabama, is coming to deliver the message. And God knows I've forgotten her name. Tanya, you give me her name right quickly before I go. Okay, Reverend Stokes is going to teach on tomorrow night. Um, okay, I'm not leaving here un until Tanya give me that pastor's name. Okay. Uh, remember Sunday morning? Oh, okay. I, I, I can give my sponsor uh, a plug. If y'all like my bracelets, somebody said I wear too many of them, but they mind. I wear men's. I want them. Uh, if you like my bracelets, hit up Dr. Willie Mae Stokes, and she will hook you up. Now, I get mine free, but you got to pay for your praise the Lord. 
Oh my God. And uh, hit up the Nitro if you need your body sculpture. And I think she does taxes also. Okay. Uh, if you got a business and y'all support uh, and your business support MTV ministry, hook, let me know. And I promise you, I'll give you a plug. Okay. Uh, let, let's see. Tanya put a name down and, and, and I'll let it get by. Tanya. Oh, okay. Reverend Monique Summers. Yeah. Me, uh, Reverend Summers from St. Luke Missionary Baptist Church will uh, deliver the nine o'clock a.m. pastoral sermon. Dr. William May Stokes also does an excellent job repairing braces. Okay, so if you're uh, with two, uh, 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 where, okay, Tanya said that, well, she does that job replacing them. So if you need your braces replaced, uh, see Dr. Stokes. Okay, God bless y'all. Dr. Stokes' husband, Reverend um, Rap Stokes, will teach tomorrow night. God bless y'all. May he keep y'all. It's probably, it's probably too late for me to go watch R&B Loach Poker, but Peace out.